Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of Lens with Advanced Design. Uh, today's guest is designer uh, Dan Hardin, and a little bit about Dan. And um, Dan is uh, the founder, CEO, and principal designer at Whipsaw, a highly successful industrial design user experience and engineering consulting firm that has brought over 900 designs to market since 1999 and for many of the world's top companies. Uh, Dan previously served as president of Frog Design, where he developed products for lumineers like Steve Jobs. He's also been granted over 500 patents and personally designed hundreds of innovative products ranging from baby bottles to supercomputers and have won over 300 prestigious design awards. Dan, thank you so much for being a part of our Lens sessions. We're so grateful to have your time and for you to tune in and um, share a little bit about you, yourself, and then your life at the moment. But most importantly, talk about the golden age of design. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna turn things over to you and I advise all of our um, audience to please start sending in your questions. If you can please put them in the Q&A and I will do my best to integrate them into our conversation that we have with Dan. So thank you, Dan. Great, well, you're very welcome. It's, I'm happy to be doing this, especially during this time. I was just mentioning to Hector a few minutes ago how important it is to feel connected to this community of designers. We've got each other, but um, I know it feels odd to be sitting at home and wondering what can you do as a designer to make a difference? But uh, let's, let's just have a nice conversation about design. I'm happy to share some of my experiences. I've had a wild career and I continue to have a wild career. I always feel like I'm in the middle of my career and then I, you know, I'm really most excited about what I'm working on today. Um, when Hector, I think, read my bio and maybe got some feedback that you were interested in this so-called golden age of design, I, I smiled because I think we all have a different definition of what the golden age of design is. You know, when I was a design student, I think the golden age of design I consider to be my heroes like um, Ettore Satsas and Mario Bellini and Dieter Rams, you know, all of whom were in Europe. So, and, and I really wanted to learn so much from them. Um, now, when I look back, I was like, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe that you could say the golden age of design was some, you know, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. But I think in a lot of ways, we're still in the golden age of design. I think this, you know, what we're doing now, I'm talking design as a whole, the way that we are, we are really bringing technology and people needs and experience and sustainability all together finally i think we are probably in the golden age now but i'm super happy to be talking about what interested you um, about some of my experiences working with these unbelievable people that that like george nelson and hartman esslinger and dean richardson and rupert murdoch uh larry ellis and many others i've had the good fortune to work with um, I don't think too much of that was, I don't know about luck or destiny, but I, I think in design, you have to sort of make your career, you have to make the decisions to advance to a place where you really dream of being and dream to do the work that you, uh, to actualize on the dream of doing the work that you feel like you can do and to be super open-minded about learning. I'm going to share my screen here. If I think you have to, oh wait, let's see. Do we see that? Yep, we're good to go. Awesome. So, yeah, a setting sun, a golden age. No, I, I don't view this as like uh, the golden age, but I'm gonna talk about this anyway. And I'm gonna start with trying to move my, there we go. Many of you know George Nelson, um, I had an internship with George Nelson in, oh my gosh, this was uh, 1980, 80 or 81. And there was, you have to remember, there was no internet. So I actually got, I was really, I found out from reading a book about George Nelson that there was this fantastic designer in New York City. I went to the Yellow Pages 
in the Cincinnati library. I looked up design firms in New York City and I called George Nelson's office and I asked to talk to George Nelson. At that time, he was already a very famous designer. He had already started, you know, so many programs at Herman Miller, worked with Charles Eames and so forth. So I ended up, I talked to him very briefly. Um, he looked at my portfolio and he offered me a job to come for six months to his New York office and work with him. Uh, I had previously had an internship at Richardson Smith in Ohio that I found to be truly life-changing and inspiring. I mean, that was a, an epiphany for me to have been in an office like that where I really got exposed to design. And then I learned about George. So that led me to this, my second internship with George Nelson here. Now, I kind of figured, oh, George is going to be this, this uh, uber passionate designer type person the way that I was. And when I got there, I found that he was kind of unapproachable and a little bit cold. And I was just an intern. So I, I think at first he just really didn't want any part of me. And I think partly because during that era, you know, he had accomplished so much already. And by the way, Design Within Reach has recently made him the legend that he, he was, but he, they just exposed him because they're really producing so much of the great work that he worked on back in the day. But here's the great thing that happened to me at George Nelson's office. And by the way, he was kind of a, crump, a grumpy old dude. He, he didn't look as nice as he does in this photograph here. And I was wondering, how can I, how can I learn from this man that seems so unapproachable? So I decided one day, he disappeared every day from the office around four o'clock in the afternoon. We were up in this high rise on the 18th floor in Gramercy Park. And it was like clockwork that he would leave at four o'clock. And so I decided to follow him one day. He was a bit of a scary fellow. So he was going into the bathroom. It was a community bathroom on, on this 18th floor of this high rise where the office was. And he hid cigarettes and a coffee maker behind the toilet, this community bathroom. It was this big old fashioned marble bathroom in, in the heart of New York City, an old, old building. And it overlooked Gramercy Park. He stayed in there for a long time, drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes because his wife was the office manager and she didn't want George smoking and drinking coffee. I thought that was hilarious. So I was just a sponge. I was a student and wanting to learn so much from him. So I just struck up a conversation with him in the bathroom while he was standing at the window overlooking Gramercy Park. This is the view while he was smoking his cigarette. George and I ended up meeting almost every day for the rest of that summer. And we just talked design. He opened up to me in that weird environment as odd as it was, uh, there was an echo in that room. So every piece of wisdom that he stated, I heard it twice as his words bounced off of these marble walls. I'll never forget this. Remember, I was, I was pretty young. So I was probably uh, 20 years old at the time. And I came to George Nelson with kind of a dreamy eyed vision of what design was. And George kind of shattered that. Um, especially as he was looking out at New York City, he would complain about consumerism and capitalism and waste and sustainability. He was way ahead of his time in this regard. He thought that most things were, that were manufactured by man were junk. He liked that word a lot. Now this, I, I, I found it so surprising because to me, again, I, I was just thinking design was about beauty and culture and you know, all these wonderful things. And George is like, no, you got to watch out. If you're a designer, you, you have to wake up and realize that to make a difference, you've got to, you have to be real. You have to provide solutions that, that are much more timeless and sustainable. Of course, at the end of the day, that's exactly what he was doing when he was doing all that work for Herman Miller. So that was a, a fantastic lesson. It was a, a time that I'll never forget. Um, I'm really glad I had that with him because he died about a year and a half after this time that I worked with him. 
So it's a total gift. Throughout your design career, um, you need to seize on these moments when you're working with people that do inspire you. Really just take it all in and learn from it. Um, I ended up landing at Henry Dreyfus Associates after I graduated. And this is another American icon. Uh, Henry Dreyfus had just died, however, and it was Henry Dreyfus Associates. But they were so well known for all, the, oh, there's me designing tampons when I was at Henry Dreyfus Associates, <laughs> uh, cutting paper and sketching and being very hands-on. I'm still very hands-on this way. I'm, I'm a real designer's designer in, in the way that I'm consummate in how I express myself as a designer. But Dreyfus had done all these incredible products, you know, Polaroid, AT&T, different railroad companies, and so many products, um, you know, the Honeywell um, thermostat that Nest was very inspired by, for example. At this company, I learned about the business of design, how you can incorporate business and design to make sure that not only you can be successful, but the firm. And I learned what it takes to run a consulting firm. They exposed me to proposal writing and selling design and how to present in a way that is persuasive and compelling to your client. I was there for six years and I was kind of the, um, at Dreyfus, I guess they were, they, they called me golden boy. So <laughs> I was the one who was always really reaching for uh, some pretty radical solutions to the point where some of them were shot down and I was getting a little bit tired of that. And I, decided there was really only one place I wanted to be, and that was Frog Design. And Frog at that time was a much smaller company. They were these wild Germans from the Black Forest. And that led me to an introduction to Frog. And I'll never forget the first time I met Hartmut. That's Hartmut there now. And uh, that's Hartmut on the cover of Business Week wearing my jacket. Here's a frog on the jacket. and. Um, I ended up staying there for 10 years. And this was for me, my kind of, it was a much fuller actualization. It was a time when I could really be myself. I just, I'll never forget that feeling of the liberation when I arrived. It was very, very different. They were, they were wild compared to Dreyfus and compared to Nelson. They were really reaching. They had this motto, form follows emotion. And some of you might know that, that I really personally related to. And I, I finally got to see what they were talking about. Now, at this time, you have to remember in 1989, when I joined Frog, they had completed some really seminal work for companies like Sony, the Sony Trinitron, the Walkman, uh, the Apple computer line was uh, wrapping up when I joined, but there's another story there. And they had designed so many interesting consumer electronic products and housewares, all of which had this, this, this power, this internal power that spoke to you on a level that you sometimes didn't quite understand. You were always compelled to pick up, use, look at, be excited by, and delighted about the things that, that they were producing. And there was this, it didn't exactly have a formula for it. It was a little bit chaotic most of the time. It was just a bunch of really interesting, talented people thrown in a pool and we were all kind of competing with one another. It was not an easy place to work. We worked a lot of long hours and, um, but I always had fun there. That's why I stayed there a decade. Some people only lasted one or two years because it was a pressure cooker. Um, I happened to really like Hartmut. He and I really saw things eye to eye. He was sometimes difficult to understand. Um, clients had difficulty understanding him, partly because of his his thick Schwabian accent, Southern Germany. So then I'll never forget when a client would listen and shake their head and they were impressed, but then they would look at me and say, can you translate for us? Even though Hartmut was speaking English. Um, I learned that pretty soon because um, my first week at Frog, I was assigned a few accounts. One of them was Sun Microsystems working with one of the founders, Andy Bechtelsheim which became a very big, important computer company. One was Logitech. Logitech was just getting started. 
and uh, I was working with Pierluigi Zappacosta, the founder there. And Steve Jobs had just left Apple, as some of you know from that history, and started Next. And we had a retainer with Next, and Hartman asked me to work on that project as well. Uh, so th uh, these were some of the real early fraud things. And this is Steve introducing the Apple IIc, which I was highly influenced by. At the time, that was a very cool design. It would just kind of represented a harbinger of things to come really in technology. It was sleek, it was refined and organized and white and uh, just so beautiful. Um, now, for me, it was more a question of like, how do you transition from Apple to Next because it was the same customer. And I ended up meeting Steve every Friday afternoon at three o'clock to present ideas for his next computer line. And I've got depth of stories working with him and uh, what it was like. Um, yes, what you hear about working with Steve Jobs is true in that he was tough. Uh, he was impatient. He was very quick, very smart. Um, he could, even though as a designer, you think, well, all right, I haven't really figured out that surface transition yet, or I haven't really addressed the connectors in the back or what have you, my minor little detail that no client would ever see, he would, and he would call you out on it. Um, there were never niceties. There was never a, a hey, how's your week going? Um, you know, how's it going? No, it was just, what have you got for me? He was intimidating. Um, I always came back to the fact that I'm a designer and I was confident in my craft and I was determined to not be intimidated by him. If the, when I went into a meeting, I'll never forget this, even though I thought one of these days he's going to attack me because he attacked everyone. And the attack was more um, being scrutinous about a detail that maybe you hadn't thought about. Whether you're a marketing person or an engineer or a designer, you always had this like, I'm gonna find something. So I thought it was a, just a moment that uh, I was gonna have my moment sooner or later and he walked into a meeting. The first thing he said, he looked around, there were three of us from Frog. He walks in the room and he said, who designed that AT&T answering machine? Now, I had just finished it. It was a, it was a client, AT&T, that I brought for him, from Henry Dreyfus Associates. Uh, there's a picture of it in here in a second. And I thought, okay, here it is. Here it comes. This is my turn. And he looked over his glasses, looked at me for this long. It's great. And then carried on. We carried on with the meeting. Talk about a, a relief. So I passed. So from then on, he, I, I was accepted by him. And he, that was one of my, my earliest interactions with him. Uh, but to say my heart was coming out of my chest uh, would not be an understatement. It was really um, extraordinary to, to be in that moment. I'll never forget that. I had other culminating meetings and opportunities with him working with, with on an Oracle project with Larry Ellison, where a dinner with Steve and Larry, and the three of us were just talking about like the future of computing. And um, it, was, it was a remarkable moment. I wish I could have videotaped this. It was uh, just simply every part of this experience is extraordinary working with a guy like this. Um, we can, I can answer any questions about that. I'm gonna guess there's going to be some uh, Logitech, uh, you know, giving birth to a company like this, you know, a little startup and then designing all of these mouse products and trackers and it was just a, a really great experience. Uh, there's an AT&T answering machine that uh, really rocked the design world when this was done, believe it or not. It was all digital. And the Acer Aspire, this is another one of my favorite projects that I worked on when I was at Frog. Now these are these look like big clunky PCs. You know, you look at these things now and it, you kind of laugh, but you know, these are CRTs, monitors, and 
big CPUs, but uh, we really gave it a, a quality of humanity, I think, uh, in the asymmetry and the shotgun hole pattern. Believe it or not, this was just so radical during that time. Uh, it rocketed Acer from number 10 in, in consumer ranking to number two, one or two. Uh, their sales uh, went up by 10x. It was just an extraordinary testimony to the power of design and what it can do to a market to move a market. And then we went on to produce, I don't know, I think at Frog, I was, I was acting as, uh, you know, as like a creative director and VP and then president, but uh, always hands-on design. Everyone at Frog was hands-on. Uh, we all pretty much designed. We had producers on the side that would help designers. It's a pretty good setup where we were just given the tools and the space to, to create and nothing got in the way of that creativity. And it worked. I mean, you know, we start. When I started, there was a team of maybe 10 or 15 people in California, and we grew it to about 200. Um, it just, it worked. And um, I ended up hiring a bunch of really great people, um, people like Eve Behar and Gadi Amit and um, many, many others that, that came through the studio. And we just, uh, we were having a blast. I mean, we were, we were like a rock and roll band. It was just, every day was fun. Again, it was a lot of pressure, but it was, it was fun. And uh, I think at the end of the day, that's really what design is. If you're not having fun, you're not doing something right. Design is all about exploration and discovery and doing things that haven't been done before. And I, I revel in those moments. I, am, I crave these euphoric moments of, of epiphany when you just, you're like, oh, this is it. We go down that road, you try it, of course, there's rigorous process in everything that you do as a designer, but um, our process, the way that we honed it during those frog days certainly influenced me. And when I found it Whipsaw, it was, um, it was pretty clear what I had to do and how to extrapolate beyond what I had learned in all these different companies. So for me then, it, 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 at the end of the 90s, it, um, I'd been there for 10 years. It was an amazing run. I loved my job there. But it was like, if I'm ever going to start a firm, it was then. And I had always had that dream since that, my days at George Nelson and Henry, uh, Henry Dreyfus Associates and even Richardson Smith, my very first co-op job. I just really had this urge to have my own firm. And I, different people are you know, feel differently about this. Some designers think it's, there's more security and uh, you can go deeper if you're in a corporation. Maybe that's true. Um, except for the security part, I think uh, consulting is actually more secure. Um, but if you have a dream to have a design firm, you kind of have to do it. You just, just go for it. Um, I had amazing parents that always supported me. And I think I just had this attitude like, oh, I can do anything. I was just, the, you know, I think a, a brash, bold, fearless young guy, and even when I was 15. So it was just like, well, of course I'm gonna do this. So I never really looked back. I just kind of jumped in and did it. Um, I thought that I'd have to start at the bottom, but you know, the first week of founding Whipsaw, Cisco Systems called because they said, well, we loved working with you at Frog, so we want you to do the future work at Cisco. And a very cool division at General Dynamics that was doing high-end computers called and Creative Labs called. So within two weeks, I had three giant companies from which I could actually start building Whipsaw. And I think that was 1999. That was, I cannot believe it. It was 20 years ago. It does not feel like 21 years ago. And before I show, I could jump in now and show some of the, the recent work and how some of this, um, the previous experiences from this golden age of design, as we called it, had influenced me. I could jump in and talk about that if we have time, Hector. What do you think? Yeah, I think we should uh, continue to move forward with what you're about to show us with your whipsaw work, and then we can kind of start integrating all these questions uh, towards the end of this. Sounds good. Okay. I'm going to kind of blast through this, and but we can always uh, come back to anything and talk about it. One thing that I really learned that was so clear, especially as a consultant working at Frog, was the importance to, of 
collaboration, people working together as teams. And it's not only your team members as designers, but it's also you, the consulting firm and the client. And I saw some things broken when I first got to Frog. There were a few clients that weren't happy because they felt like some design was just being thrown at them and uh, forced on them. Uh, but being raised in Ohio, I definitely had this kind of like, well, I'm going to listen to you. And I'm a Libra too. So it's like, I like the idea of balance. And a whipsaw is a long two-man saw. It has a handle on two sides. It takes two people to operate it. It requires reciprocity, give and take, lots of listening. And I think that's what the design process is about. Um, you can't just can't just do design in an isolated bubble. However, there are moments, of course, when you have the brainstorm and you are all inside your, your head. Um, but anyway, I liked it as a metaphor. This is a, a presentation I just gave a, uh, a few weeks ago, or about a month ago. Uh, it's called Future, it combines the future and urgent, because I think there is an urgency about what we need to do as designers as we move forward into the future. And a lot of the philosophies that we use here at Whipsaw stem from a lot of the, what I just showed you that I gleaned from working in these different firms. People interacting with products all day long, whether they're playing, working, entertaining, etc. Industrial designers have a massive influence. We touch lives all day long from the moment you wake up. This is a process that we go through on all the projects I'm about to show you that really comes down to, this is oversimplified of course, but I call it esteem. You learn a lot about design thinking, of course. I think there's so much missing when you talk about design thinking. I really think it's important to observe, research, and then to first see, just simply be with a problem Problem. sit down, become the user, really absorb what the issues are and use your deepest method of getting to a place where you can find your insight. I call this emotive problem solving, this, this C part. Um, I think, you know, all of my design heroes always, always did that. You know, the seeing was more important actually than the thinking part, which sounds bizarre, but you know, you have to like go inward for that and be inspired also by your team members. But of course, the thinking, the logical problem solving needs to be joined with that so that you can then be armed enough when you go into your exploration phase where you now have a lot to think about and work with. The exploration should go very wide and deep. Um, I do not think, the old notion of like a designer sitting down with a pen and saying, I have an idea. Voila, there it is, client. Sorry, that's, that's old thinking. Your client often knows a lot more than you do about the problem and you need to try things. You need to respond to what is presented back to you. You need to strategize with them and one another so that exploration phase needs to really, really be wide and deep. Uh, then of course you go into evaluation and then you float back and forth, bounce back, back and forth. You might have to iterate after you evaluate, go back to exploration, go back to see, go back to think, and then finally make it. Make can be either making prototypes, defining your product, um, or optimizing it for production, or even, even going into production. You better have purpose. Purpose is really, really important. Like why are you designing a product? Uh, this is a recent product we did for Google. It's Google Trekker. You know Google Maps, you know Google Earth, but those only document the world where cars go. So we helped Google create a package with LiDARs and six cameras and a computer that does all real-time computing. So it's documenting the topography and, and photography all at once. So now when you go on Google Earth, you're looking at a lot of the content that this produces. So um, purpose is also finding what do people really want and why should you do it? Why should it be relevant to one's life? Um, this is a baby bottle we did for a company called Adiri. And it's, the design looks obvious. You can see the inspiration, Mother Nature herself. Um, it was soft and pliable. It was, you never uh, could administer a bubble. So it didn't cause colic, the crying when baby occurred, when there's too much air that, that uh, gathers in the stomach. 
because they had a better valve. Uh, facial recognition is coming. Uh, security is changing everything. This is used in many different airports around the world now. It's, uh, it lights up the face. The user interface is very clear, very simple, super clean. Ingenuity is very key. This was just announced uh, a few weeks ago. This is a light. It's a new fixture, but we're looking at lights on ceilings and uh, track lights, realizing that why do you have to take every single one of those lights on the ceiling and aim it? Why can't you aim the whole fixture? What if we move, we kept the LED stationary and moved the reflector behind it, and then we took 10 of them in a row and moved them all with one toggle on the right side? This thing is crazy. You aim it at a wall, you can aim it at the floor of the wall, uh, the sides. It has a huge range of motion. But the fixture itself never moves. So now if you have a gallery or, or you know, a commercial application, everything is in a row, all the fixtures in a row. It's really extraordinary the way this thing works. Again, ingenuity, always come back to this as, as designer, in my opinion, you always have to bring your ingenuity forward. And that means often engineering. This is a portable electroencephalogram. Electroencephalograms are big sheet metal boxes that cost a lot of money and are only readable, the results are only readable by a neurologist. But a lot of the seizures occur when you're unconscious and a seizure, if this continues, can actually kill you after about two or three days. So this actually picks these signals up immediately. Um, this, the way that this thing works, I don't have enough time to get into it. Um, you can dive in on our website and find out, but um, this is changing the way that doctors are, are um, monitoring brain waves and certain neurological conditions. It replaces a gigantic machine, and sometimes it takes more than one day to get a reading in a hospital. This you get in less than six minutes. Um, we've done surgical devices, reinventing carotid artery surgery. Um, you would think, well, why is an industrial designer helping on that? If you understand that design is about process and problem solving and humans working together, you realize, well, why can't you reconfigure a surgery? We, re we help to reinvent how you do carotid artery surgery to clear plaque, which is the primary place where an embolism starts, uh, which causes a stroke, of course. And uh, I don't have enough time to talk about this one either, but it just shows like just applying your ingenuity as a designer, you can not only delight people, but you can actually save their life. Uh, today, there will, be, there will be many people's lives saved because of this invention. Um, this company just went public as well, so you can also make companies very successful as designers. Uh, we worked on the Nike Fuel Band. This is a three-year project. Uh, we worked with Astro on it, um, but we did all the engineering. We saw it through completely. There were 35 trips to China. Lots of development. I'm most proud of the fact that there is no air inside this device. It was the first electronic product where there was no air. It was all solid state. We actually shot translucent um, black uh, TPU. It's a type of uh, flexible plastic directly on the top of the circuit board and the LEDs. It's uh, just completely solid state, like your arm is solid state. It's like an extension of your body almost. You better be making connections. Really connect with that end user. Uh, this has not even been announced yet. It's a, um, it's a modular backpack where you start with a core and then you add a basic bag for general purpose, a travel bag, or a gym bag. Each one of them has been designed specifically for that particular need. But the core bag is what you would have every day. Because so many people we found are carrying giant bags. They have like five or six backpacks and they don't quite always work. You go to the office, you have your computer in it, but there's this, all this extra volume. Um, so anyway, this, this is a company that we, we co-founded and you'll be able to buy one of these soon. Uh, so these are cameras, monitors for uh, Cisco Meraki. There's all kinds of cool technology in here. And we actually wanted to kind of make it so much fun they almost look like um, ice cream. These are hugely popular now, and it's part of our future. Even when we're doing something as banal as a router, we try to give it a sense of soul and life 
and uh, connection. Um, this router is, you know, it's wireless, you can't see it. The, the signals are flying across the air. And so we made this a little bit like a seagull. We designed 90 products for this company, TP-Link, and they're now number one. Nobody knew who they were before we started and they didn't really change too many electronics, but we just keep innovating with the design. It really put them in number one rather quickly. Uh, we designed the drop cam, drop cam camera monitor for the home. And it was a, the first surveillance camera that was friendly and cute and you could adjust it because it had an X, Y, Z motion. You can rotate that, that camera lens. Uh, this was so successful that Google bought them and uh, incorporated it into the Nest product line. Uh, we also did the Google OnHub as uh, all bamboo and uh, real bamboo, three layers of veneered bamboo and uh, just a very cool electronic product. Uh, you've probably seen these at the store. These are now Brita's best-selling water pitcher line. Uh, we brought the filter up to the spout so that it filters as you pour. So you no longer have to wait for that water to trickle through that bottom filter. And you can now see the water. Uh, we, we basically convinced Britta to let the water be the hero, not the pitcher and not the filter. Let's really visualize all the water. Um, I like that reductionism is uh, a trend in technology. Um, we really exhibited this on Chromecast when Google asked us to visualize a, a and productize a set-top box that would allow one to cast content from your phone or your notebook to your television and stream with it. We came back and we said, we wanted to plug in the back of the TV so that the TV and the content on the television becomes the real experience for the end user. So that little device, it's only a few inches long, just plugged in the back of, of the HDMI and it's powered by USB on the back of the TV itself. It was a different way of thinking about a set-top box um, this is Google's most successful hardware product, and it really changed how you stream content on your television. We also did the UX on the screen itself. Um, sustainability is essential. This is uh, just one example of sustainable packaging we did. This is a completely compostable um, label printer cartridge for the German company Lights. Um, Staying sleek and slim through reductionism. This is a video conferencing system. This is a die cast aluminum bar with a machine microphone slit in it and a camera box in the center. That paddle on the bottom is a foot, but also a paddle for when it's attached to the top of the television. This is a lifetime oil filter, literally a lifetime combustion engine oil filter. After 12,000 miles, you take it out of the engine, take filter outside of the filter and you swish around in gasoline and put it back in your car. This was inspired by the medical products, uh, many of which we have done, where we took very, very fine surgical stainless steel wire to create the filter because we could thereby match the typical contaminants that would run in combustion engine oil to the size of the screen because all other oil filters are paper pulp and the holes are either too large or too small. So they get clogged or they don't work. And uh, this is extraordinary. Your mileage goes up a little bit, like 2%, uh, but more importantly, 400 million oil filters alone in this country are not thrown away. Now uh, the Dell Precision line of computers, these are hugely successful. You know, they typically have a run of four or five years on a product, but this is now more than 10 years running uh, because it's so successful to Dell Precision. Some of you might have this. Um, we still believe in emotion, man. You gotta get to the heart of the matter. This is a, a robot, uh, it's a home service robot. And you know, it, this thing feels very alive when it's, when it's used. Um, this is another home service robot for a company called Martian Robots. Um, being emotional with your design solution, really sometimes being exuberant, being a little show-offy sometimes can really stimulate a market because there's a sense of pride when you buy a product that you can really personally and emotionally relate to. Well, nothing wrong with that. Oh, these are just a few of the products we've done for TP-Link. Um, talk about emotion. Uh, I never would have thought, because none of us here are gamblers, 
we would design slot machines, um, but world's top selling slot machines are the ones that we did for Aristocrat. Uh, this looks nothing like any other slot machine. We just wanted to enhance the play, enhance the audio, enhance the visual, and create cool design, and it really works. And our objective was not to, to encourage people to sit down and dump money in this and lose money. It was more to provide value in the play. So that, you know, like you think about it, if you go to Disneyland, you're gonna pay 15 bucks for a ride on average, and you don't expect to get that money back. So um, we just really wanted to give the user a much better, fuller, richer, more emotional experience. Um, and it changed the industry completely. We brought it out of the, that gaudy age of, of um, you know, wood grain and um, bizarre forms. It's, it's a bizarre industry. Uh, light, you know, now we, we say CMFL, it's color, material, finish, and light. We're using light, we're painting with light the way that we do with finishes and textures. And, uh, light is now incorporated. We've learned so much from this industry, and we're putting light, interesting light fixtures and techniques and, and many different products we're designing. Wonder is another huge thing for us. Um, I always believe that you've got to, you have to tweak psychology, you know, in a positive way. Make, you know, having a wondrous state is part, part of being alive. I, I love it when you can, you can almost make piece of technology feel like magic. This was a router we designed and all we did to make people have a sense of wonder is expose the internal antennas and chrome plate them and put them behind a very special symmetrical window. That's it. It was very simple. But people looked at it and were like, oh my God, what's going on here? Look at all this. What's this magical thing? No, these are just standard antennas. It's just a matter of exposing them. Sometimes as a designer, all you really need to do is reveal an inner faculty, find the essence of something, and give it a voice, and that's your job. This thing is insane. This is a, a sensor that can smell organic materials, uh, pathogens in hospitals, explosives in airports, and it does it by using living rat brain neurons, which are inside this thing. And there's air circulating over this bath of nutritive uh, material in which the neurons are located. And they're sitting on top of a silicon chip, which are connected to a computer. And once the receptors on the neurons pick up something like a certain pathogen that they're, they've been programmed to, or explosives, like on an airplane, it then signals to the computer that they're present. This thing actually works. It is the future this merge of biology and technology. The technology, the way we think about it is, is typically electrons and silicon and a digital experience, but the future will be incorporating us, life, life forms. Humanism, huge humanism. What I mean by this is really, really offering people some solutions where you feel alive you, through the empowerment that the product and the design is, is giving you. And sometimes you sense it, sometimes it's very real. You designer types that are watching something like this get what I'm talking about. Most people don't. Most consumers are just like, well, I don't know why I like something. I just like this thing. It just feels good and it's kind of cool looking and I want it. And the more you can create that kind of humanistic connection through your design, the higher chances that it will be timeless because people care about it, they want it, they want to use it for a long period of time, and now you're being sustainable, now you're using energy in the right way. And it is one way that you get around this paradox as designers creating all this new stuff that will ultimately end up in a dump. Like George Nelson told me. Uh, some of you might have this, the tile trackers. We did these, they're really cool, very touchy, humanistic quality about them. Uh, we're doing a lot of like food service robots now. We're doing a lot of robots all of a sudden. That's the new frontier. Uh, these, are, these are used in various restaurants now to, to uh, deliver food, bust the table. Uh, air purifiers. Like, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on a little bit here. Um, these are lunch boxes 
for kids that are completely customizable and fun. Um, finally, this area called unification, which is bringing all of these factors I just talked about, having a real strong purpose that connects with humanistic qualities with emotionality all together into a solution where we're using the material experience, the, the purpose of the machine itself, the functionality, and also the, the more extended social community aspects through a user interface. Uh, this is the Tonal Home Gym. It's um, very popular right now because gyms are closed. Um, this is on the, on the left, this is what it looks like all closed up. Um, on your wall hanging there, just like a television. At the bottom of that, just for frame of reference, is about two feet off your floor. And you can do every single exercise, every single exercise you do in the gym, you can do here. Lat pull downs, goblet squats, bench press, all time types of curls, tricep, bicep, etc. Uh, this was very tricky to work this out. Uh, it was three years in the making, but um, boy, does it work. Uh, we've also been helping Uber with overall strategy, including bringing the Uber experience to kiosks um, and also the new Uber Beacon, uh, which is using their new brand. And this is a way to bring riders and drivers together. Um, it's used in the, uh, obviously in the dashboard. And um, it's uh, very colorful. And there's a display in the back of this, which allows the driver to communicate with a rider without necessarily speaking. Or if you have a window, which is going to be great because a lot of these now have plexiglass sheets. Uh, a lot of cars have plexiglass sheets to keep the driver away from the rider. So I'm going to pause there. I think that was uh, the last slide. And I'm going to stop sharing so we can talk, Hector. Sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for sharing um, so much work that you've done for so many great people and so many people you've hired that have gone on to do amazing things. Um, I'm going to start integrating some of these questions um, uh, into our conversation. One of the questions uh, that was asked by Tiffany was, you know, you have an, a, a quite a an expansive career and you've learned so much. Have you ever thought about um, writing a book about all of this? It's in the works. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, I, I do enjoy writing thinking pieces. There's a lot of them on our website. Um, there's a new one coming up, a series that's about the future of design in the 20s. And I think you'll all really like this. Uh, it's a nine part series. And, um, it addresses all kinds of things like artificial design intelligence and what do we do about this pandemic and why why does the what should be the roaring 20s feel like the jarring 20s and so yeah i one reason i've been slow at writing a book is i love to work i love to solve design problems that is one of the reasons i'm very prolific i don't just like to think about it and dream about it but i like to do it um, actualization is very important to me as a designer. If you have ideas, if you are blessed in the way that you can think about problems, if you can create, you, you owe it to yourself and the world to actually do it, like fulfill that purpose. And, um, you know, it's, it gives you a, a real connection to the rest of the world. It also allows you to really feel good about being alive. Design is one of these professions where you you can really have a sense of peace in that you have provided something benevolent for the world to benefit from. Absolutely. Um, someone who now runs your own, uh, you know, studio, uh, you're the principal designer at Whipsaw and uh, um, are you still part of the hiring process when it comes to hiring interns? Um, because I'm sure that you also have, um, you know, creative directors involved in, in HR and uh, other other stakeholders. Um, you know, we have a question here from Griffin. He would like to know what sort of skill sets, tangible or intangible, do you and other professionals look for in an intern? So someone who walks into Whipsaw and is looking to to have an internship there, what are you looking for? 
Yeah, well, two questions. One is I don't look at every single applicant that comes in, but what I will do is typically look at like the finalists because yes, I've got directors that, that review literally for like every summer, we'll get f about 500 applicants. It's a little crazy. Um, and sometimes it's very difficult to get through it all. There's, I mean, there's so much talent. There's so many great designers out there now. Um, you know, what we're looking for is some differentiation. You know, a lot of our, we look for what our clients look for in us, right? Our clients are coming to us so like, can you break through? Are you different? Will you be able to provide us with a design that is unique and therefore very saleable? Are you smart? So therefore, can you solve problems and prove it? So we seek this in individuals. We, we want a, a point of view. We need design excellence. So we're looking for, you know, beautiful, functional, experiential kinds of solutions. Um, we also like interns that, that are somewhat outgoing. You know, they don't have to be total extroverts, but, you know, we want them to not be shy and come in and just kind of merge with, with the team right away. Um, even though I might not be that involved with the hiring process, what I do is I will sometimes work with an individual um, intern on a project where it might just be me and the intern. Now, I'm not very good at CAD anymore, but the interns are coming in with all these, you know, hey man, I'm so good at Rhino and SolidWorks or ProE or Alias, you know, they've got all the tools. So they, um, they love working with me because I will, I sketch constantly. And, um, you know, in the morning and the evening, I'm always sketching and drawing or if I'm not drawing and I'm painting, like literally, like you would think that I would have enough creative outlets here. No, I still have to paint. I still have to make furniture. Um, so I'm obsessed ab about design. It's really, it, it's, it's just something I do. And um, so anyway, we're, you know, we also look for that, that attitude, that spark. You know, we want, we want people to be making a contribution here. You know, we're not a huge, we could be a much bigger company. We choose not to be because it is very personal. We are like a family. So when you, when you add even an intern, you know, that might even be here for three or six months only, sometimes a little bit longer, they make a difference. They are actually making an impact on the company. And we have such an amazing alumni of interns out in the world doing great things where they learned how to be a designer here. You know, they might go to school for four or five years and then they come here and they're like, oh my God, you know, what I did in three months. Some of our interns have had products go, go to market, you know, that they maybe conceived of and did as much as they could within that short period of time that we maybe closed it out on details, but it's their design that goes to market. And that's, that's really cool. Yeah, our interns always leave enlightened, more talented, brighter, et cetera. Yeah, so it would probably be a good idea for those interested who, who want to come work at WebSaw to probably look at your website and kind of get familiar with the products that you design so like that they're coming in with an idea of like an expectation of, of what you're looking for to hire. Probably, um, but keep in mind we're really diverse in our, in our client base, so we design like I mentioned, you know, well, as you just saw, you know, consumer electronics, industrial equipment, medical goods. Um, we're getting more into housewares and furniture. There's going to be some furniture released soon that's um, really fun that I've personally been doing. And um, so, yeah, there's really not an area of design that we don't do. So, um, and, you know, as a young designer, you often don't know exactly what, what you should be designing. You might like technology, you might not you know, um, but that's okay. I think you just have to try it all. Malcolm Gladwell said, you know, in Outliers, you, you have to work for 10,000 hours before you really know what you're doing. You know, I mean, that's, that's four or five years. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get the hang of it. And then all of a sudden, yeah, okay, you start, the ideas start to come to you. And it's, I remember these moments where I just had, you know, just like, oh yeah, you just kind of wake up and realize, man, I, I'm really fast on this now. Mm -hmm. You know, that was like, you know, I think by the time I was at Dreyfus for a couple of years, it was just like, you know, everything was clicking and fraud was a huge change for me that first year, especially, but it felt right. I've kind of, I finally realized like, this is the firm I need to be at. This is where I fit. We had, <coughs> excuse me, we had other competitors like IDEO and I'm like, yeah, you know, that just, it didn't fit who I was. Somebody said, um, fraud was the rock and roll band. 
IDEO was the symphony orchestra and Lunar was the jazz band. And I, I'll never forget that because it's like, yeah, that was it. And you know what? I, I, love, I love jumping on lead guitar and grabbing the drumsticks and beating the hell out of those drums. It was just, you know, fun. I still have the same attitude today. I still feel like I did when I was, you know, my 20s designing. Fantastic. Is there a project that you've worked on that has taught you the most about the design process? And that's a question asked by Sam. Mm, uh, I've worked on so many different design projects. Um, I learned, I literally learned something on every single project. This morning before this, this call right now, I was on the phone with a new client and we are learning how to clear a thrombus in the lung, which is a blood clot, an embolism. And I'm not an MD. There are all kinds of tubes and suction and safety concerns. Me and my team will learn so much on this. And again, you have to use that whipsaw method where you, you, you have to be fearless about how you learn. You have to realize, okay, on this particular topic, I'm a total dummy. On this one, we had done surgical products, so I'm not being a little bit facetious here, but you do have to go into every design project with a super open mind and enough personal security where you don't have to act like you know everything. We certainly don't, I certainly don't. You just go in and you, you, you bring your gift forward and you listen and you're relentlessly curious relentlessly curious, keep asking questions. And if there's the tiniest shade of, of misunderstanding, you dig deep to find out what is it? What am I not getting here? And you can usually put together a solution that will win. So I have that attitude going into every single project. Um, bigger projects, you learn a lot about process um, and different projects are um, the processes have to be very different. You know, the process you use working with a little startup company where they have to just get something out quick because they've got some seed funding that's only going to last a few months. Very different process than if you're working with a, a Dell or a Samsung where you have, you are a piece of a long series of developmental sequences that will have to come together you know, over a span of two or three or maybe even five years. So you have to tweak your process around that, that need. Um, and then just remember to just learn at every single turn, you know, even on the little projects, like, like that Adiri baby bottle, I learned a lot, you know, because the babies couldn't give us any feedback. I thought until one of the babies took one of my prototypes and threw it at me and hit me in the head. It's like, okay, well, I guess that's a form of feedback. It wasn't written and it wasn't verbal. It was physical. It was violence. I guess she didn't like that one. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's just, so I guess it really wasn't one. I mean, there are, I, I think the more comprehensive your design problem is perhaps you learn more from all the different exposure to marketing needs, uh, strategic corporate needs, um, engineering requirements like tonal would be a good example of that where there's just design and engineering and UX everything all kind of wrapped and compressed into one and the learning was very high on something like that yeah. but that's you know the learning about process and the learning about solution making drives me forward I've never gotten to a place where I'm like okay I think I know how to do this as a designer I try to be really fresh every single time and and that got and i try to i try hard sometimes to be really naive about a particular topic even though i've designed a million computers and things like that a lot of high tech if i go in thinking i kind of already know what to do i kind of know the formula and yeah i could sit down really quick in two minutes and draw something it's probably going to work but that's no fun and that doesn't get you the fresh ideas and i don't you know that that's how old designers get old you have to constantly reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to be fresher than you could, you possibly even know how and be super open-minded. Try the strangest thing you possibly can. Challenge yourself to get way out of your own cranial box and, 
and be experimental. That's why I emphasize this exploration so much. Yeah. Is, um, you've worked with so many people, so many brands, so many companies. Is there a brand or company that you haven't had the chance to work with and would love to? Um, I think I'd like to work with Elon Musk. Um, I like how brave he is. Um, he's got moxie. He's, he's super assertive and he's in, in fields that I totally believe in. Um, and I think I'd get along with him. You know, I somehow am able, I'm not intimidated by guys like that. Too many designers are, I guess, I, I don't think afraid would be the right word, but they're sometimes shy and introverted. That's okay because a lot of really good right brain designers are shy. I was, you know, I was, I was kind of shy and I was very much in my head as a designer when I was very young. But I soon realize if you're going to make a difference, you, you have to really step out and make your proclamations as a creative person and be, be brave yourself and not be intimidated by these people. Like I said, working with Steve, it was like, I had to, even though he was yelling at people around me, I always came back to my center saying, I know design. So if he comes at me, if he wants to criticize me about something, I'm a better designer than he is. By golly, bring it on. And I never let that attitude down. And he saw it in my eyes. He saw it and he loved it. You, and he responded to that. Larry Ellison was the same way. Larry Ellison was worse. Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle, was incredibly tough. Foul language all the time. He threw about 30 of my sketches and Eve Behar's sketches on the floor of his dining room and told us they're all shit. Now they were. They were all pretty good, but he was testing me. He's like, well, you know, he wanted to make sure that I had the metal to make it through a whole program with him because he knew he was tough and he wanted somebody that could take it and be challenged. It was just, I just like picked up his sketches. I said, stop, don't do that anymore. Um, I'm not gonna show you any more work. Show me around your house. You show me around his house. And I got all the clues I needed about what he was looking for in the design. I saw purity. I saw geometry. He was inspired by Japanese architecture. And we got to the end of a one hour tour of his house where he was so passionate. I'm like, okay, Larry, I got you. Um, I will send you this solution tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock. He said, you're on. And, and I did. And um, he was thrilled with it accepted it and we ended up having a great relationship and getting a lot of great projects done. Again, you got to learn from every one of those and be inspired by them all. Yeah. It sounds like uh, working with, if you ever do work with Elon Musk should be a walk in the park then. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, there's, I like uh, Richard Branson as well. Um, I think it'd be interesting to maybe work with Bill Gates. I haven't worked with him. Um, I think he's brilliant in a lot of ways. Um, he's not really involved in, in product. He's, he's very involved in UX, which really interests me. Um, I'd like to work with a lot of, um, a lot of maybe, maybe not designers or engineers, but people that make policy on how to bring design to a much bigger, broader, universal audience. I, I, I don't like designing luxury products. Um, I think the real area of growth for designers should be in the areas in the world where we are needed the most, uh, solving serious environmental problems, sustainability problems, um, educational problems, social problems, um, needs of, of poor societies. Um, design is, because design I think has been over the last 50 years too much focused on marketing and revenue forming, making more profit selling more product. So of course, most design is going to be sponsored by the first world. But if you think about what we do, bringing betterment for mankind, well, that, that should apply to 8 billion people, right? Um, so I think I'm most interested in working with the people that I don't know about yet, or that will surprise me as the future unravels. You know, like I got a, a call from the Duchess of York and she's involved with um, like girls' education in Northern Africa. And she's like, uh, Sarah, the Duchess of York. And, and she's like, I think, you know, we could use Whipsaw's help. 
to, and she's like, I'm not exactly sure how, I just like the way that you guys think. Um, cool, you know. Wow, that's really awesome. Um, all right, now I've got to find a really good question to transition to that answer because that was really, uh, that was really great. Here's a question regarding to the situation that we're in right now, right? We're in this pandemic and a lot of designers have lost their job or have been furloughed and it's very unfortunate what's going on. Um, a question was asked, you know, this designer is a bit of a crossroads um, and for what he wants to do next. He lost his job because of the pandemic and he wants to know if you've ever experienced an unplanned gap in your career and how did you navigate through uncertainty? What a great question. Uh, luckily, I did not have a major gap in my career. Um, uh, but again, I wasn't faced with anything quite like this pandemic. I am now. Um, we've had to respond now. So I think I can speak, you know, I'm in the same boat, but not the same boat that you are, but in the same, we're all experiencing the same thing. And we've had some clients that are in the entertainment world or travel related, like Royal Caribbean cruise, cruise lines. We're doing a lot of technology work for them and, the, and in regards to monitoring people on boats and so forth. Though that work just, that account, dead in one day. Uh, one of the gaming companies you're working with, gone in one day. Um, and there were a few others. Um, you know, you, you just have to like pick yourself up and tell yourself, look, this is temporary. Um, the time will move on and we will get through this. Um, designers, I think, are particularly skilled at getting through something like this because we're so used to the problem solving process. So, you know, make sure you polish your portfolio. Use this downtime as an opportunity to polish that portfolio, polish your story, do some experimental design work on your own and reach out to people maybe for feedback. You know, people are dying for more community interaction, like what we're doing right now. Um, utilize this time as uh, something good. Turn it around and tell yourself, because, you know, we are only what our own reality tells us it is. Just don't, don't blame the world. It's, it's what we're all experiencing right now. I would say just um, use your creative skills to channel optimism into an endeavor that will ultimately feed into either in the future, a better job, a better opportunity, or maybe it even, maybe you do so much introspection that it opens your mind into thinking, wow, maybe I should be a furniture designer, or I think I'm really interested in marketing instead. Um, yeah, I wouldn't get too bummed out about it. I know it's, it's weird, we're living in a really strange time. Um, Seems like one thing after the other, not, you know, our politics were already horrible and now, now we've got even more, you know, yeah. I must say, I wouldn't have, I did not expect this in the twenties, you know, I would have thought, you know, 30 years ago, 2020, oh my God, that's the future. We're going to have, we've colonized the moon by now. We would have already landed on Mars. Uh, we would have cured every disease, including cancer. We would have designed, um, you know, transcontinental aircraft that takes us to Europe in two hours. No, what happened was this, we didn't think about this, the, the world in our hands, all this technology, the, the ability to do this, these subtle things. And ultimately, I think that's, that's good. There's a lot of goodness in this because it's, it's the only way that we can all come together. It's the only way that we can really advance our civilization. So, I hope I, I hope I answered that in a way that, that helps you, whoever answered that question. Absolutely. Um, and that's a very good transition to my next question. And this was asked by Adam. Um, recently, Alphabet CEO um, Sundar mentioned in an interview with The Verge that hardware is hard. What is your take on this? What do you think is the hardest thing about designing a physical product, especially with the mobile electronics space? Um, I would agree with him, um, but fortune favors the bold. 
And I got into it because uh, one, it just spoke to me personally. I was super inspired even as a kid when I would see a, a sports car that I just like went crazy about. Hmm. Um, I just wanted to do hardware because I found it to be so tangible. And I, I love, I think when you're a craftsman and you're an artist, you like materiality, you like tangibility, you want to use all of your senses, you want to touch things and, and um, really fully experience them. I mean, we're, as humans, we're, we're very uh, keyed into our material world because it's the key to our survival. So to me, it was like a natural thing to do. And I don't mind that it's hard. I like a good challenge. Um, if things were easy, I think I would be bored. Um, and I actually like it whipsaw that we get some real nasty problems. I mean, um, I, we're kind of getting known for that. It's like, oh, we, we tried this company, we tried that company, go to Whipsaw, now they're gonna solve your problem. I think because we embrace it. Um, too many of the big tech companies are afraid of hardware because they can't make their money back fast enough. Hardware takes time. You have to go through the process of inventing it, defining it, prototyping it, tooling it, manufacturing it. Oh my God, what a headache, they say. But the companies that embraced it a long time ago and that understand it, companies like Apple, BMW, Nike, and many thousands of others, they master it. And yes, it's hard, but the rewards are great. I would say in many cases, much greater. Um, because it can be so much more multi-sensory. Uh, that is not to say that a lot of the digital experiences are, are less than multi-sensory or less important because they aren't. As a matter of fact, their digital future is paramount to all of our lives, um, our existence, even it's existential, it's become this way. And um, AI will ensure that that's the case. And um, you have to be prepared for it. There was a second aspect to that question that. Uh, yeah. Um... What do you think is the hardest thing about designing a physical product, especially within the mobile electronics space? Um, I don't think it's very hard to design hardware. Um, I think maybe the hardest part is to, is to get everyone on board that you're all on a mission together and to get your client maybe to do the right thing. That can be hard sometimes. Um, it can get frustrating as a consultant when your client might not agree with your direction. They might not want to spend a penny more. If, even if your solution is just amazing, you know, as a designer, you know that if they did this, it will be more successful. Now we're pretty good at persuading our clients, but some of them are stubborn and they don't do it. And it's hard to convince them to go back and forth. And then they'll often come back to you six months or a year later saying, you know what, you guys are right. We should have spent the extra dime. Uh, we're now ready to do that. Um, sometimes it's hard convincing clients to do, the right, to do the right thing regarding the environment. Many take the easy route and go with virgin materials um, or a complex process that requires too much energy to manufacture something I'm very much against that. I like simplicity of the complete solution, not just a thing you're looking at, not just the object, but it's what the energy it takes to make that object, to process it, to deliver it to you, for you to use it and for you to ultimately discard it. You have to look at this in a complete holistic manner and to get your client to do that, that can be hard sometimes. Yeah. Okay, um, can I ask a couple more questions just so that um, you know we make sure that we're on time and respect your time, of course. Um, here's a question from Alex. He loves the attributes that you add to your products, emotion, wonder, sustainable, et cetera. Is that typically part of the design brief from the client or is that an opportunity that you see as you start working on that project? That's the latter. Uh, it's rare that a client will come to us with these lofty ideas about their product. After they work with us, they do. Mm -hmm. Most clients come in with 
um, a set of criteria. They'll have like a product requirements document or a marketing requirements document. And it all, it's always the what. It's, you know, it should have this feature, it should have these components, it has to do this, has to use this much power. Uh, maybe there's some uh, limitations. It, it can't be less than this or more than that um, in regards to performance or cost or uh, market reach. You know, there's, there's some kind of general limitations. It's rare that they come in and they say, you know, we want, we want a quality of, of magic or we want it to have a high emotional appeal. Although a lot of clients will come in and say, we just want this design to be sexy. Now, that means completely different things to every single one of us, a little bit different. So it's up to us to give that nuance and granularity. When somebody says, I want it to have magic or make it sexy, that's about as deep sometimes as the narrative might go that you get from a client. It's up to you as a designer to dig deep and find out what is their brand all about? What do the users expect? What do they need to do in order to use these very humanistic qualities to catapult their brand? And that's part of your design solution. It better be. Otherwise, if you just follow the criteria, yeah, you can produce another widget, right? And it might be okay. But it, will it transcend? Will it be magical? Probably not. So you have to, and that's a huge difference. The philosophy here compared to a lot of firms is like it has to go through our process that thinks about these higher levels of consciousness and expectation and psychology. Even though the client is not asking for that, they're going to get it because that's the only way that you're going to ultimately connect with the end user because the end user, whether your client gets it or not, the end user always does. And it's that moment when they're comparing that product with a sea of other competitors, you know it. I'll think about all the products that anybody's watching this, the products that you really love. Yeah. They make you feel something They're They have a sense of wonder. They, they do feel good. Maybe it's just the quality. Maybe it's, Maybe it's the quality of one of the senses that it is tweaking. For example, it, it, it makes a certain sound when you use it. Sometimes that's enough. But you as a designer, again, as the, as the crafter of that complete experience, have the opportunity to devote your creative problem solving towards a solution that brings the right elements together for the desired effect. And that takes some skill. That is, um, it's delicate because you can do, you might think you have a really good design and if you just do one tiny little thing to it, that last 1% of the project, all of a sudden it goes from being an, an excellent design to a freaking mind blowing design. Sometimes just that little extra thing. And it's often the thing that's like the memorable little hook in a design. It might be a feature, a detail, it might be, a little thing that it does that just makes you feel something. Yeah. Now you did talk a little bit about how your company also, um, you know, you do engineering work. You did that, you know, the Nike fuel band with the collaboration with Astro. Um, you did engineering for it and, th and uh, uh, someone wants to know, Mike wants to know, how do you nurture the engineer and the designer relationship at Whipsaw? <laughs> oh man, what a great question. That has been a challenge my whole career. Most designers, as you know, we are dreamers. We are glass half full types. We're, we're always going to reach for the impossible. I love that about designers. Engineers are usually the opposite. They're very pragmatic. They want, um, they want to make sure something is going to work. They're often very different kinds of people, even though the overlap is always there. We're very different people. Engineers are, are not as generally speaking, not quite as social, you know, like even the engineers in our, in our team, they're often on their keyboards and mouse with the headphones on. Our designers are kind of loud and running around, including me running around. Hey, what about try this? You know, hey, oh my God, come here, everybody. Um, we're very different socially, you know, in the office. We put them together like fish in a bowl and we kind of force them to work together. Um, 
we also try to inspire one another every single possibility like we float ideas and concepts at every week in a monday meeting we'll float ideas to one another so that engineers can appreciate where designers are coming from designers can appreciate where engineers are coming from um, there is that builds respect i think if you have respect between engineers and designers you get better results um, i personally have used sense of humor working with engineers sometimes engineers can really be a downer in meetings with your client got a client and you're already you come in as a, a designer a consultant and a designer two bad things to an engineer you're a consultant you're an outsider oh how do they know anything about what we do you're a designer oh my god here comes the artist they're going to tell me how to engineer my product that's not going to happen i'm not going to let them do that you need to show them that you know what you're doing you're not going to show them something stupid that even though maybe some design comes from starting out as a really stupid idea. Take it one step at a time, get to know them, use that whipsaw effect, use a sense of humor, lighten the mood in these meetings and get the engineers to, to feel what you do as a designer. This is the, this is one of my tricks and that is to, expose this this beautiful thing this beautiful world of design in a way that it's not me telling them you should engineer your product like this make it look like that and work like that it's more let's talk about the problem i'm going to expose how i think and they start to see rapid visualization like sketching in a meeting jumping up to the whiteboard and listening to the engineer oh, okay that's a problem that's not going to fit in that part what if we did this then they start to realize, oh, they're actually really trying to help us. This designer is really trying to help us. And wow, I think they're going to make my engineering project a lot better. And wow, I think I just got some extra patents because of this idea that the designer had. So now the engineer is coming along your way. They're starting to cross over into your side. And I love when that happens. Sometimes it takes a few weeks. Sometimes it takes a year to get the engineers to, to understand the designer, where the designer is coming from. And it's, it's up to you as a designer to, to, usually it's up to the designer to, to um, build that bridge and make sure that that engineer knows that we're on their side too. Because, and you have to realize as a designer, if you really want to get your, if you want to extend your values out into the world, it helps to get them mass produced because your values as a designer, they're already embedded in your solution. That you are inside that design the same way that, you know, you have a child, you're in that child. Design is very similar in that way. You, you put your DNA into it and it's, it's out there in the world. When you, when you get your design mass produced, it's out there in the world expressing what you believe as a designer. The only way to get that out in the world is to honor engineering, to respect it, to use it and be inspired by it. Engineering can be just as inspirational as design. If you don't believe that, go study how the 747 was developed. Go look at how the Golden Gate Bridge was engineered. Um, look at mega projects. Look at what SpaceX did to do what they did last week. Um, engineering is remarkable. It's, and the sooner you realize that as a designer, the, the more products you'll get to the market, the better your designs will be. And I love design where the design and the engineering are so bonded that you don't, it never looks like, oh, okay, there's the guts, that's the engineering. And then this designer came along and put this beautiful body on it, the way that Sergio Pininfarina would put a beautiful body over the Ferrari chassis and motor combination. Today, design is, in my opinion, is much better when you've got this merge between the two. I mean, you mentioned Apple before. I mean, Apple is a good example of that. You know, those designers love engineering um, the way that I do. And engineering and design, sometimes you just, you don't really know when one starts and the other stops. Well, we're going to wrap this up with this last question. And, um, and I think this can, I would love, this is a question that I would love to ask so many you know seasoned designers because i think we're all very different in this aspect but you you work a lot you know you pour 
a lot into Whipsaw and what you do. How do you maintain your mental health and your well-being? Good question. So one of them was a way that I already revealed, and that is um, fine art and always be connected with the things that inspire you. I'm inspired by travel. I love watching how people go about their daily lives. Um, I especially like traveling in the more undeveloped countries because I think you, you get more exposure to like what raw humanity is without all the shopping and the goods and all the designs that are in people's hands. I just like finding the real human. Um, I like to be inspired by things that I read and, um, you know, but really there's, there is also this moment where I love standing in front of a big blank piece of canvas because I don't have a client giving me the product requirements document. And I don't have a team member saying, I wish I could work on that because I have an opinion about that. And it's just you and your soul. That's it. <laughs> and you, it's, a, it's about creative expression. So that relaxes me. Um, and you know, the, I think the biggest thing for me is to, to keep balance is by keep doing it. I know this sounds weird, but my work relaxes me as stressful as it can be. Um, oftentimes when I am stressed, like if I'm on an airplane over the Pacific and we're shaking like crazy, I will start sketching and it relaxes me. Um, sketching and thinking about problems um, and design in general, just I find inspiring. So I'm incredibly lucky to be inspired by and relaxed by my actual work. So my profession and my life are so merged. Creativity to me is not something you do to solve a problem. It is a lifestyle. Creativity is what keeps me going really at the end of it. That all of what I just said is all about being creative and that's what keeps me balanced. Uh, keeps me chilled out. You know, if I hear that we lost a client or whatever, I just think, okay, well, it is what it is. And you know, it's about just, yeah. It's a, it's a good question though. Well, we hope because, that, yeah, no, go ahead, finish. Because design, design is hard. It can drive you crazy, especially when you have a deadline. Um, and the world runs on deadlines. So, you know, we might not be ready with a solution and a client, you know, you're looking at your, your budget and your clock. Okay, that's hard, by the way. That's hard sometimes when you're, you know, you've, you're being forced to create. That becomes discipline. You know, knowing what it, you have to put yourself in that state of mind and you have to be able to control when you are, when you know that you're going, you're, you and your team are going to be primed for solving a problem. You need to design that into your process so that you can meet those deadlines. But sometimes that's hard because most designers are like, oh, I haven't thought about it yet. I need, to, I need a weekend to think about it. No, sorry, it's due tonight at six o'clock. Um, and so there are many things that can drive you crazy, especially as a stressed out consultant. And therefore, I think it is very important to find your work-life balance. And um, for me, su surprisingly, I think that I've been able to pretty much keep it under control. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a workaholic. But um, in this case, the alcohol is not bad for me. Yeah. Um, well, we hope that when you do uh, get your book published, you know, we get to see some of those sketches in there. Um, you think I should have sketches in there? And I, I think oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, okay. Yeah, of course. We, 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 us, I think us designers, we're visual creatures and we want to see, you know, all the behind the scenes work that designers do, not just the nice sketches that you present at a client presentation or something like that. Right. So, yeah, I have heaps and heaps of sketches. I call them the Genesis sketches. And they're the, the, wow. the ideas that, that like ultimately then got, chosen and pushed into production but you know like i'm working on this chair right now it's a lounge chair and there are literally hundreds of sketches they started out as real general scratchy napkin type sketches all the way to like the finest little detail about the fasteners and the the wall thicknesses and everything else so um yeah just everybody should keep all that stuff you never know when it's going to come back you'll you'll appreciate it later keep everything i wish i had some of my student 
I, I don't know, I lost some of these renderings that I did as a student. I have some of them. Yeah. Uh, we'll do another <laughs> session while I share some of these uh, really wild paintings that I did back in college and uh, some of the early designs that I was doing. That would be amazing. That, yeah, that would be amazing for everyone to see, I think, um, you know, to to show our audience that, um, you know, it, it, is, it isn't all nice and pretty and rainbows and things like that, that uh, especially from, you know, um, someone like yourself who ha has worked for so many clients and companies um, to show that that's that that right there in itself is, you know, the the, the gold nuggets that that keep us younger designers, you know, um, inspired and motivated to 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 include that in our work as well. Is that what inspires a lot of a lot of young designers? Do you think you're seeing that that raw process, the sketching, the thinking, and documenting those things? I think for me as an educator, it definitely is. When I'm teaching my students, um, you know, um, I think students have, at least from what I've seen in a student portfolio, they have the tendency to segment to fragment their portfolio, like you know, here's intro, here's my research, here's my sketches, and here's my prototypes, and here's my exploded view and my renders. And it's so fragmented. Um, and I think when you're talking about showing, you know, all how you're sketching these furniture pieces, but then you go in and you dive in and you sketch, you know, the screws and the fasteners and things like that, like that, that is something that it's all together. It's not a fragment, you know, your mind doesn't, at least you as a designer, you, you, at least how I tell my students is you want to, when you're designing a product, you know, and you're showing in your portfolio, you don't want to have a page that shows that you did really quick Google search on how this is going to be engineered. You want to show that throughout the whole portfolio, you want to show that you're thinking about how this is going to be made from the beginning to the end to show your knowledge of the object and how it's going to be in the market. Absolutely. And you might as well get used to that now, especially when you're even in school, because the same thing is expected. Clients want to see deliverables. Mm -hmm. Clients, what they, they're paying money for consulting service. They want the solution. Most clients are like, we need a great solution. Some could care less about the process, but most do. 98% of them, they care. They want to see the sketches. They want to see the sketches that didn't work. They want to see all the failures. And design is a lot about about failure. If you think about all the different designs you do for one project, only one solution is usually the one that gets produced. But there are 99 others that are in the trash bin or sitting on your server that will never get out in the world. You have to get used to that. And, but the client loves it when you show that because it says something about the right solution. So you have to sometimes show the wrong solution to your client for them to understand what the right solution is. And even if we're trying to strategically guide a concept forward, sometimes we have to, it's like a game of chess. We're going to show this because we know that's going to be rejected. And then they're going to have a realization that they really need to do this over here. But we know this one isn't quite right yet either. And then we're going to suddenly at the last second, boom, checkmate. And there's the final product. And, the, and they see it, they get it, they accept it, and then, then you go forward. But a lot of clients, they, they, they don't necessarily make it easy to, to, to allow you as a consultant to get there because a lot of times that client is, um, thinks they know better, and sometimes they do. Um, but the process that you go through, this, the sketching that we were talking about, the renderings, the CAD work, the models, the animations, the storytelling, all of this is important to build your case. And also realize that, especially as a consultant, design is a performance art. Um, we will literally build rapid foam core models from our shop during meetings. If we get ideas, we are constantly sketching. On one screen here, we'll have CAD going on, a whiteboard sketching going on. Sketches filling a table while the client's sitting there during these workshops, they, when they see you as a designer solving problems like this, oh my God, you, they're clients for life. Because most people don't think this way. Designers are an unusual breed. Most people just can't see it. Mm -hmm. So when you can just say, oh, I have an idea, and then you walk up to the whiteboard, and you sketch it in perfect perspective, and then with a side view and a cross section, an orthographic top and bottom view, 
They're like, well, where did that come from? How did you do that? You know, of course, you, I, I don't really know. Um, but I'll tell you, that's a very saleable thing. <laughs> that's how you keep clients for life. But you can't be afraid to do that. Again, it's about being brave. Designers need to be more brave that way and, and realize that performance art can be fun. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you so much for being a part of our session, Lens with Advanced Design. Um, you're a fantastic storyteller. And, um, you know, we really appreciate your time and really looking forward to that book. Um, for our audience that tuned in, thank you so much for coming on this awesome journey with Dan and his experience working at these powerhouses and now creating your own powerhouse here at Whipsaw. And uh, I hope all is well. Thank you so much. And we're going to be recording this, or this has been recorded, and we'll make it public to our audience on our website and our YouTube page. So make sure that you subscribe. Thank you, everyone. Dan, have a wonderful Thursday. Thank you so much, Hector. I've really enjoyed it. Um, great questions. And uh, someday I hope to meet all of you at a conference or something. Or if you're in California, Northern California, come visit us. We're in San Francisco and San Jose. Absolutely. And I think when things go back to normal, we'll figure something out where we can bring you out to Chicago. That'd be great. Sounds good. Take care, Dad. Right. Thanks, everyone. All righty. Bye-bye.